Good evening. Good evening. Our God is an awesome God, isn't he? And what a blessing and honor it is every time. We can worship together as we are doing this evening and have done this morning to worship our awesome God. We continue here on Sunday nights looking at lessons driven by 1 Corinthians or that great letter written by Paul to the church at Corinth there wherein the church was dealing with a number of issues. And because of that, we get one of the great doctrine doctrinally filled, if you will, books in all the Bible. There were so many different things that were being addressed as Paul was answering many different questions that a large number of various and exhaustive doctrines are found. And through the text, we found ourselves now in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And over the last three weeks or so, we have looked at and examine the first two verses therein where Paul was discussing the sexual immorality that had crept into the church that had not only been found in one of the brothers there in the church, but had arrogantly been ignored by the church there. And of course, Paul, in instructing them not to be such, not to allow such, not to be ones who are okay with such. He then began, starting in verse 3, to discuss what you and I are going to talk about over the next few Sunday evenings. And that is what to do when you have someone who is in such an intolerant, sinful state, refusing to repent. What do we do as individuals within the congregation when one of our own finds himself in need of church discipline. <clears throat> it is by far the hardest thing anyone could ever be involved in. Any member of the Lord's body, it is the most challenging, the most difficult, <clears throat> the most heart-wrenching, Reality, and yet it is exactly what God expects. In these few verses here, verse 3 through what really should be, I have 12, it should be 13 there, the end of the chapter, Paul begins discussing how to correct, discipline this individual. And so with that in mind, let's examine our lesson for today. If you have your hand out, Notice the first point we're going to look at. Before we can understand church discipline, we have to understand biblical fellowship. But what exactly is biblical fellowship? If we were to define this word fellowship in light of, of course, God's word, how God would define it, what would we find? Of course, like many words in the Bible, this is one of those that has taken a beating, so to speak. Over the years, that has been twisted and has been turned to mean that which it does not mean. Christendom in large has taken that word fellowship and distorted it or really neutered it in many ways. It has come to mean simply an agreement based on a singular belief. It has come to be defined by most people an agreement based solely on a singular belief. It typically goes something like this, as long as we agree that Jesus is our Savior, then everything else is minor or insignificant on that. We are in fellowship with one another as long as we agree that Jesus is our Savior. It doesn't matter if our doctrines are completely different. It doesn't matter if we teach, believe, and think one thing is a sin when another group thinks another thing is a sin. As long as we agree on this one singular issue, then we can be in fellowship. However, from a biblical perspective, from God's perspective, as you and I know, that's not the case. God has never taught fellowship 
between him and his people and everyone else, 1 John 1 and verse 7, that which is based on one singular belief. In fact, if we look at the word for fellowship in the Bible, the Greek word in the New Testament is found 19 times in the New Testament. And when you take a look at this particular word, one of the things that you find is that it can be translated into three different things, all corresponding with each other, all having similarities with each other, but the context dictates slight differences within each. We see it in its most typical form of fellowship, 2 Corinthians 6 and 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? The word means, of course, to agree and be of the same mind, if you will. But we see it here being fully described in its most typical and normal biblical usage of being equally yoked versus unequally yoked. Fellowship is being light with light. Darkness with darkness, righteousness with righteousness, lawlessness with lawlessness. There is no mixing between the two. We also see it translated <clears throat> as sharing Philippi or Philemon, excuse me, verse 6. And I pray that the sharing, there's our word there, of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Lastly, we see it used in its translation as contribution here, 2 Corinthians 9, 13. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. When we really break down and look at this word, the reality is, from a biblical perspective, when we talk about fellowship between God and us, and us and others in the Lord or in God, what we're talking about is a combination of all three. Fellowship is a single-mindedness that seeks to share in the company of like-minded ones who each contribute to the needs of each other towards a common singular goal. So fellowship is the idea of being perfectly harmonizing and united in God. And of course, this is exactly what we see throughout scriptures. First Corinthians, as we remember verse 10, which we looked at, a few months ago, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. This is what fellowship is. Fellowship is a single-mindedness in God that comes together with others that are like-minded in the same way who have the exact same goal to get to heaven according to God's will, Matthew 7, 21. To his plan, his desire. Paul would later write Philippians 1, 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm notice in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Fellowship is being in one spirit, one mind, side by side for the faith, the one and only faith of the gospel. This is why Paul would then declare of those in fellowship that they would have one voice, Romans 15 and verse 6. The Lexham Survey of Theology, properly, I think, in this case, defines church discipline. In light of fellowship is this, church discipline is defined authority delegated to the church by Christ Jesus 
to maintain order through the correction of persistently sinning church members for the good of those caught in sin, for the purity of the church and the glory of God. In other words, it's meant to help the church stay in fellowship with God. Now, with that being the meaning of church discipline and us now seeing and being reminded of what fellowship truly is, we need to remember that we cannot grasp fellowship as that which has been redefined in simply believing one simple thing or believing in something in common. No fellowship, especially as it relates to church discipline. Fellowship is being completely and fully in tune with God in each other's lives. That's important when we talk about our second point, and that is biblical disfellowship. We have to know fellowship and understand it for this to make sense. Who is to be disfellowshipped? Obviously, no one, as we said earlier, wants to even consider the reality that this must take place from time to time, but it is a reality nonetheless, and it's unfortunate. But the reality is, even those of us who have obeyed God's gospel plan of salvation, have had our sins washed away, have been raised a new creation to walk in a newness of life, will and can fall short of the glory of God and sin again. We can miss the mark of righteousness, be a part of lawlessness, which is sin, and if we are not careful in such, fall prey to it over and over. By that I mean, we can, even as a child of God, not be obedient to God. We all know Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's, of course, in reference to those who haven't obeyed the gospel, but to those who have, John would write in 1 John 1.8, 1 if we say we, Christians, God's children adopted into his family again to walk in as a new creation in that newness of life, if we, say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him that's God a liar, and his word is not in us. The reality is, as Christians, as God's children, we can sin still, and we will. And because of that reality, every single one of us, if we don't guard ourselves against sin and are not vigilant to be in fellowship with God by walking in his life, then there is a danger of falling from grace. Paul would say to those who had obeyed the gospel, to his fellow Jewish brethren, who had heard the good news of Jesus Christ and had obeyed it, but were caught up in sin. The sin of wanting to hold on to their past baggage and hold on to that which was hindering them from walking fully and purely and maturely. And the newness of life said this, you who have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Does someone, every time they sin, fall from grace? Certainly not. Thankfully, we are and have the mercy of God. His grace covers us through the blood of Christ, 1 John 1, 7, as we walk in the light. One does not fall from grace simply because they have sinned. One falls from grace when they continue in sin. In fact, the Hebrew writer would say it this way as we looked at a few weeks ago in verse 26 of chapter 10. For if we go on sinning deliberately 
After receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. As God's children adopted into his family, faithful and true, or one striving to be faithful and true, we have to guard ourselves from not being that one who falls from grace because we have decided to sin deliberately and keep on doing so. Or as Peter would put it there in 2 Peter 2.15, forsaking the right way. Jesus, in the great chapter there, Matthew 18, he illustrates what these two things look like. As those who should know better, yet could find themselves falling from grace, he illustrates it in Matthew 18, 15 through 17, when he says this, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, continues to deliberately sin, Take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses if he refuses to listen to them. Tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. When one finds themselves deserving church discipline, it's because they have ignored those they are in and have been in fellowship with. Not only God, but their brothers and sisters. And they have chosen to not listen. They have chosen to refuse, in fact, their plea. From those who love them dearly to repent and come back. Who will find themselves being disfellowshipped? Who will find themselves in the crosshair of church discipline? It's those who choose to deliberately ignore God and his people's plea for righteousness when they are in sin. But knowing who is to be disciplined is one thing. But what is the purpose of it? Knowing who is to be disciplined, that gives us information. It tells us and shows us the facts concerning this reality that there are going to be those that will need church discipline, that will need even up to the point of disfellowship. But what is the purpose of it? The one who is in need of such has become so flippant concerning sin. So arrogant, as the Apostle Paul would describe it to the church there in 1 Corinthians 5, in verse 1 and 2, that they have forgotten how God thinks of what they're doing. How God sees sin, deliberate sin, in their lives. That he sees not only their sin as an abomination, but a betrayal of his love for them. Of all that he has done for them. And it behooves us to understand then, when church discipline is necessary, why we do it. This fellowship is meant to literally destroy the flesh of the person to restore their spirit. Notice how Paul would say it there in our text, 1 Corinthians 5, 4 through 5, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be destroyed in the day of the Lord. Church discipline. This fellowship is meant to destroy the sin in their lives. It's meant to uh, completely alleviate 
and evaporate that which is keeping them from being in fellowship with God and us. Because when the flesh is alive, the spirit is dead. And Paul says, if we want to help someone, help their spirit be saved and alive again, then we have to destroy their flesh. That's powerful words. This fellowship is meant to wake the person up beyond anything and everything that has ha happened or gone on before. It is meant to be a, a proverbial slap to the face, spiritually speaking. This fellowship is also meant to produce, because of such, godly grief and then repentance in their lives. Paul talking about the very man he's discussing here in 1 Corinthians 5 would say this about him and the others who have repented based on things they had done. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Paul says, listen, the reason why I told you this man who was deliberately sinning who was crucifying the Hebrew writer would say in Hebrews chapter 6, Christ over and over again in his knowledge of the truth and rejection of it. The reason we give him up to Satan was for this purpose. So that it would wake him up. So that spiritual slap to the face would grieve him of what he has done. That he has disappointed his creator. That he has dishonored his creator. And that in so doing, he has soiled his relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and everyone else in fellowship with him. This fellowship is meant to cause a godly grief, a mourning of one's sin that forces one to come back and be with God again in fellowship. Which is why, as Paul would say in Galatians chapter 6, 1 and 2, this fellowship is meant to restore the one who has been lost the one who has fallen from grace. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, keeping watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Biblical disfellowship is all about bringing that brother or sister who has got caught up in sin and has fallen from grace, getting them to come back to God. Church discipline, this fellowship, is not something that is to be distributed mindlessly, effortlessly. It's a serious matter. People's souls are at stake. It takes a lot of prayer, a lot of care and love for the soul of the one who is in need of restoration. It takes dedication to God's word and a love for God above all else to help our fellow man when they are in this situation. And when we have exhausted every other means available to us to help our brother or our sister escape the defilements of the world that they have become entangled in once again, then we must, as God has authorized, enforce God's will and discipline this fellowship our beloved brother or sister with tears with sorrow with a heart that feels empty but the reality is when one of our own 
has donned this wrap, has followed the proverbial rabbit hole this far, they need that wake-up call. They need to see physically and emotionally what they are missing when they are not in fellowship with God. But therein lies the rub. <clears throat> because God's fellowship is with us and our fellowship with him. But fellowship is the key, isn't it? If a brother or sister has no actual fellowship with his brothers and sisters, then what God has said is the absolute last resort. That is the only thing left to help them come back. It is the only thing that he has authorized, lastly, that will have its full effect. There remains nothing. Because how can one lose fellowship with that which they never, were never in fellowship with? This is why fellowship, biblical fellowship, a single-mindedness based on a single goal that has come together with those who are like-minded in every way, to love our Lord, our God, with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength, to help each other get to heaven. That's why fellowship is so important. Because we sin. And we can. No one should be too arrogant to think they cannot. We can all, if we are not vigilant, find ourselves in a situation of unfortunately needing the love of our brothers and sisters to show us God's discipline, to delegate what God has authorized, with the hopes of getting us back. Let it never be said of you and I that we do not take seriously what is both necessary for church discipline to be effective or church discipline itself. That we never take lightly our relationship with each other because we simply don't know who will need our love, our care, our discipline of them. Fellowship is vital. Discipline when necessary is needed. But thankfully we have a God who understands that and knows you and I. And he knows that we do mess up and though we might not be in a situation where we are deliberately sinning over and over and are finding ourselves falling from grace I pray that's not the case anyway it can be a challenge and it can be difficult to go outside those doors listen it's it's encouraging and it's uh, wonderful and it's enlightening while we're here together and that's why God tells us to do it and, and encourages us to do it the rest of our lives is out in the world, right? Out in sin. Out where not everyone we know and love and care for is in fellowship with us. Because of that, it can become challenging and difficult as you test your faith, as you examine your fellowship with God. I pray all is well, but if you need some strength tonight, you need some encouragement, you need some help, let us do that. <laughs> Let us in fellowship with one mind and one accord and one goal of getting you to heaven, let us help you if you need that help tonight. Don't let it get to the point where you need discipline. If you need that help tonight, let us know by coming forward as we stand and as we speak.